For the record, I'm Ted Bowman, Ted Bow on Drupal.org and Twitter. Okay. Uh, so why automatic updates? Uh, overall maintenance of Drupal sites is high. Uh, many and many sites don't apply security updates. I'm sure exceptions in this room, I'm sure you all are all up to date. Um, and Composer is a pain point for many site builders and developers. Um, so let's talk about some definitions. So this is what I consider a manual update. You actually have to go to the command line, you run the Composer command um, yourself, and then you do some DB updates, maybe cache rebuild. Um, an attended automatic update will be if you use this module and you go to the form. So um, you actually do have to press a button but I say, you know, your dishwasher is automatic, but you do have to press to start it. So um, sometimes there's so, some confusion that automatic only means like behind the scenes, you don't look, you don't have to do anything. Um, and then unattended automatic update is you set a setting where it's going to keep you up to date with either all patch updates or just on security updates. And this will happen during cron um, when you are hopefully as asleep, not looking at your site. Um, a patch version update is when we update from uh, one or more patch versions to the last number on your left, if this is semantic versioning, um, so not a minor update. So these are usually bug fixes, no new features, and they're sort of the least disruptive updates that Drupal 4 has. Um, security updates is similar. Uh, it is a specific patch update that only that usually only covers a particular security update, and they're usually in scheduled releases. So you, it's like last Wednesday or first Wednesday of the month, um, and they usually only contain that security fix. It's not like that security fix plus a bunch of other bug fixes. Um, so in some way, you could say they're the least disruptive, and they probably contain the least amount of fixes in any particular update, but they might, depending on what the security fix is, might be more or less disruptive. Uh, minor version update, these are the scheduled releases every six months. Um, they do contain new features. Um, they tend to be more disruptive than patch version updates, but um, you know, Drupal core tries to make these less disruptive. Um, and the major version is you know, going from like nine something to 10. Uh, these are the most disruptive updates remove deprecated APIs, and that's not in scope for this module um, as far as doing automatic updates from 9 to 10, or 10 to 11, I guess it would be. Um, so current status is we're beta testing uh, the module. Um, so if anybody's interested, we can run through beta testing. You don't really have to have any knowledge of the module. We just sort of want to get like UX feedback, and also does it work on your particular system? So after this session, I'll go back over to the BOF room and can run people through. There's beta testing instructions on the module homepage, um, and it sort of uh, walks you through creating a project to update from an older version of Drupal to a newer version or trying it on an existing site. Um, so the beta module features, uh, so right now it's just patch version updates. Um, there is a hidden config to open it up to minor version updates, but for now, like the first stable release will only do patch versions um, unless you set that config because they're the least disruptive. Um, and then, so this would be, yeah, going from like 9.3.1 to 9.3.12. Um, example of if you'd had patch versions, minor. Because minor updates come every six months and then Drupal core supports two minors at a time for security fixes, then you can potentially you know, go um, one year without having to do a manual update um, to only updating via the form, um, theoretically. Um, so the update process through the UI, you were shown you know, this form, you press a button. What happens now is it you know, it'll download the update uh, you're presented with a screen where it's going to put in maintenance mode and then it applies it and then voila, if everything goes well, you're updated to the latest version of Drupal. Um, so here's a behind the scenes look of what actually is going on in a video. So you have your site visitors and they're visiting your site and you're on 9.3.11 and then 
and behind the scenes we'll make a copy of your site, a uh, copy of your code base excluding anything that is not composer managed, so like your file uploads, um, your SQL like database file if you're using that, um, basically anything that when you that would be large and that composer is not in charge of and that might be changing on your live site like so file uploads we would want to move that back over um, and then composer we run a composer command on the stage version of your site and then that will update to the next version we put your site in maintenance mode and then we move Drupal 12 or Drupal 9 through 12 over onto your main site so your site's only down temporarily uh, not for the whole composer operation, but just for the file copy. And depending on how you set it up, it'll easy, either use, we have a custom file copier or rsync to move stuff over. Um, the default is currently not rsync and only because we can't test rsync right now, but hopefully it will be soon. Um, but it's just a config setting to set it to rsync. Um, so unattended updates, is in the beta module, but we've actually turned it off with a switch for now because um, we're working on, Drupal.org is working to put in uh, the update framework, which is a protocol for securing updates. Um, it was under the Linux Cloud Native Foundation. Um, so there's a bunch of different implementations of this. Um, we've written a PHP client that will be shipped with core that will call out to core and then um, protect against a lot of different types of attacks. Um, so the Drupal.org site is not done yet, so we're not gonna ship, we're not gonna turn on unattended updates in the module because that could be potentially dangerous if there's um, an attack and like, you know, tons of sites are updating at once when nobody's looking at them. So once that is done, we'll switch, flip the switch and have it back on in the contrib module it is a tested feature that we have, you know, automated tests and confirm it's working. It's just we've turned it off for now um, until we get this implementation. So this would be, the, your Drupal site would have a composer plugin that would communicate with Drupal.org's um, server-side update, um, update framework implementation. Um, and so once that's in, we'll turn back on unattended updates. Uh, the other thing it provides is readiness checks, so periodically it'll check to see if your system requirements are um, meet the requirements for auto updates. So the idea is you don't want to be surprised when a security update comes out and says, oh, you're not actually ready to apply an update with this module. Um, because that's sort of the worst time to find out is when you're you know, applying a security update. So we check various things to make sure that your site is, will be able to apply an update if it was to happen like right now. Uh, and this would be an example on the status page. Um, this is like if, you're, if you actually haven't run update.php from a manual update before, we check that because we're not gonna be able to do the next update if you haven't done that. Um, so we just prompt you to do that now so you'd be ready for updates. Um, on admin pages, most admin pages, if you have um, the attended updates, the cron updates enabled, um, we sort of annoy you on every page. Because basically, if you expect this module to update your site if there was a security update, but we know it will not work, we want to either ignore it, you know, basically tell you that until you either turn off the cron updates because you know it's not supported or you fix the problem. Um, so just basically don't want to surprise people. Um, and then there is a sub-module, a hidden sub-module that you can unhide that does contrib updates, so updates modules and themes. Um, let's look at system limitations. So the limitations of the system are, the one big one is you have to have a writable file system uh, because we, we're updating code and that's sort of basic limitation of a updating system is you update your code, your code has to be writable. So obviously this won't work with a lot of um, hosting providers in production. Um, like at Aqua we have a cloud IDE where you could use this and then move the update over. Um, but you couldn't leave this on in production. Um, so we have other solutions for, for updating 
in production through GitLab, and I'm sure a lot of other hosting have um, updates for that, or solutions around that. And um, basically, the initiative or the number of years that it's been uh, alive has been sort of targeting the long tail of Drupal sites that are on hosting potentially where they could do this in production because a lot of those don't have full-time devs to where if an update, if a security update happens, they wouldn't have somebody to actually apply the update. Um, and they may be running on lower priced hosting. Um, yeah, possible workarounds are using it in local production as sort of like a composer UI once we have the contrib modules and core updating. Um, you could use it in a custom writable update environment. So on Aquia we have the cloud IDE, but there are other like dev environments that might be writable. Um, and then potentially you could write a module that actually, we have events all along the way where you could actually trigger something that would change the environment so you could briefly update. Um, you could run the cron updater um, as a privileged user that does have write access. Um, but those last two solutions aren't, you know, something that's supported in the module. Or I guess the last solution is something that will be supported. You just have to set it up on your server. Uh, but most of these would require environmental work on, on your part for coding. Um, it does require Composer 2 because Composer 2 has a lot lower memory usage. So uh, running the Composer command within one web request um, does work with Composer 2. It might work with Composer 1, depending on how much memory you have, but it's a lot more likely to succeed with Composer 2. Um, and then also, um, API changes as it makes us easier to verify the package through the update framework. Um, we probably could have done it with Composer 1 uh, also, but just because we needed Composer 2 for the memory limits, the Composer plugin we wrote as a um, Composer 2 only version. But I think most of Tree's been out for a long time and most people, it's what they're using these days. Um, it's not Git or version control aware. And mostly this is because um, a lot of people use uh, version control in a lot of different ways. So it's not really in scope for the module. You could write um, subscribers again that, that listen to our events and did Git commits. Um, if you used it out in production as a way to apply uh, security updates, you would be then temporarily you know, in a non-clean Git state that you'd have to revert later. So in that case, it might be using the module just so you, especially if you weren't in North America, didn't have to get up in the middle of the night to apply a security update. Um, right now, it doesn't support multi-site, um, and that's mostly because uh, since you're updating the same code base for multiple sites, you'd have to have some way to lock, um, to be aware across sites that, you know, site A is doing an update, so site B should also not try to do an update. Um, it'd be pretty easy to turn it on in the module. Um, so one thing we're looking at is have a setting in either settings.php or sites.php that would say, either, you know, this site, this is site, I'm gonna do updates, and then you'd kind of have to manage through your organization, okay, you know, I'm running an update on here, don't run the other the other sites. I mean, probably more manageable if you had like two or three sites on a multi-site, not if you had hundreds. Um, I guess if you have hundreds and you limited the permission so only one person or one site gives that permission out, it would be doable. But it's something that you would have to have sort of policy, it would have policy implications across the multi-site. Um, so when I presented at DrupalCon, I talked to a few people who were interested in multi-site support um, because they had planned to use it locally and to move stuff over. So obviously, if you're doing it locally, there is no hundreds of other sites being served that could be updated also. So if that's something you're interested in, there's a couple issues out on our queue about uh, possible multi-site uh, support. Uh, and right now, database updates are not supported in unattended updates. Um, basically because a database update could easily like leave your site in a broken state and we don't want people to have an update that they're not looking at all of a sudden leave their site in a broken state. Um, so you, if you're going through the form, you can update if there's a database update. 
Uh, the policy now for Drupal 4 is to really try to not have database updates during patch releases. So potentially if you were staying on one minor, the patches releases would be applied and you should be fine. It will detect if there is a database update and, uh, and not apply it. Um, probably to make this work on unattended updates, there would be, have to be more changes to the actual update schema system um, to maybe qualify some updates as safer auto updates, but right now there's nothing like that. Um, so an example use of production versus development environment. Um, production environment, will, using in production, if your system supported it, your hosting system, would be the simplest method for keeping your, lights, uh, your site secure, but again, it's not version control aware. Um, you need the writable file system. And uh, the stage update, so when we, we run the composer command and the copy, we can't actually bootstrap your site completely, so we can't do all the kind of testing that we might want to do on the site. We do some checks um, on that staged code base, um, one, for example, in prawn updates looking for potential database updates, but we can't fully test your site. Um, so that would be like a con in using this in production versus a dev environment. On a dev environment, you could, um, one advantage of using this would be just as a way to not deal with Composer correct, uh, directly if you have site builders that were able to, say, move stuff between environments, but they did, weren't really comfortable with Composer. Um, and easy, if you already have a method for updating Drupal and then <coughs> adding it to version control, you could do that in a dev environment. The other advantage is if you use it in a dev environment, obviously you can fully test the site after the update before you move it over. Um, any questions so far? We're talking about possible floor rollout. All right. All right, so this is a likely way that this will get into Drupal Core. The, uh, uh, not exactly how the features might roll out, but this is the current plan. Um, so it depends on testing the contrib module and getting the contrib module stable, which will hopefully happen in June and July. Um, and then each new feature that might get into Core probably depends on the success of the previous um, thing in Core. So if we introduce attended patch level updates and it goes great, then we're much more likely to quickly move on to the next one as opposed to if something goes wrong, you know, we're much more likely to sort of just work on patch updates for a while. Um, so earliest possible release, and this is probably not likely now, is 10.0, but it could go into like 10.1. 10.0 um, may have the experimental module, um, but how the experimental process works for core is if it's an alpha level experimental module in Drupal core, um, that is ripped out for the actual releases. So you couldn't, if it was alpha level experimental in 10.0, you couldn't get 10.0 and test it out. Um, it would have to be beta level stability for the experimental module. The difficulty with automatic updates is, if, say, if Layout Builder was alpha, when Layout Builder was alpha and it was only in the Git clone, it wasn't actually in a release. You could actually clone Drupal Core and try out Layout Builder. You can try that with automatic updates, but it's a lot more fidgety because if you're not on an actual release that Composer can actually operate on, then it's um, it's more difficult to test out in a Git clone. One reason is also because we don't allow updates from a dev version to a non-dev to a from a, from a dev version to anything, because if you're on a particular dev version, it's really hard to say you're basically not on a supported release. So we're not going to support people updating from sort of an unknown state automatically through the module. Um, so first likely feature is patch level core updates, both attended and unattended. Um, so this would be going from anywhere in 10, it's like 10.01 to 10.020, say. Um, potentially that would, um, would give you one year before you needed to do a manual update because, um, if you, because Core supports two miners at once. Um, so that year would give you, would mean that you're not on the most current miner. So if you were on 10.1 when this came out and you turned on uh, this module, then that would get you all the way to 10.3, but, or that would 
would give you updates until 10.3 came out when 10.1 was unsupported. It wouldn't allow you to go to 10.2. Uh, but if there wasn't a feature, particularly in Drupal 4 for 10.2 that you needed, that might be all right. Um, because 10.1 would have security support until, until 10.3 came out. Um, the next thing we would probably implement is minor uh, updates. So it's like 10.1.1 to 10.2. Um, and that would probably be only through the form. And mostly that's because almost all um, minor updates uh, would need some sort of database update. So even if we supported uh, unattended minor updates, in practice most of them would not be able to be executed because we would stage it and we'd be like, oh, there's a database update, we can't support it. Um, the other reason is just minor updates are more disruptive. So if we supported minor updates in, in during cron, and hopefully you know a ton of people use this module once it's in Drupal 4, that could be sort of have calamity if you know a miner comes out and it happens to be disruptive and a bunch of people have this module on. Would not be a good look for Drupal, would not be a good look for the module. Um, potentially though, via the form, this could give you years of, of um, without having to do a manual update because you could leave on the attended, unattended updates for patch versions and then when you wanted to go to the next minor, you just have to go to the form, press update, and then you'd get another year of um, unattended updates. So potentially, once we have minor support, it could get you everywhere from like 10.1 until um, Drupal 11 without having to run a manual composer command. Um, and then after that, I would definitely like to get module and theme updates into core. Um, maybe only attended updates, possibly unattended. Um, so this is not really a limitation of like, it's not technically more difficult to do this, but um, core has a very strict backwards compatibility policy. There's a lot more eyes on it. Um, so, and basically, it would be hard for people, um, especially if they're not like in Drupal every day, to determine, okay, I updated this contrib module and it broke my site. Was it the automatic updater or was it the actual update that the contrib module, um, the, the actual, would, have, would it have broken the, the site anyways if I had done it directly through Composer? So yeah, to me, the unattended updates of contrib modules sounds dangerous, um, maybe just for security updates. And that also has the, for security updates, it would probably be less disruptive because my understanding, um, I've been involved in a few security issues, um, maybe maybe only with core, but I think all the, all the security updates that happen in Contrib are organized through the security team. So it's not like you can't put out a security update for a Contrib module and then throw a bunch of new features in it too. You can? Yeah. I Maintainer can do whatever they want. Oh, I thought I thought it was always through like we, we encourage that to we not. Encourage maintainer to be good. But okay. As long as the important thing is the security bug is fixed. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So that would be one of the dangerous reasons of like allowing any kind of unattended update for contrib modules because we don't really know what the people are going to do, um, and there's not. So I think really probably for this to happen in for unattended updates there would have to be some sort of policy change or some sort of opt-in. Um, because I think the current ecosystem, and I speak as a contrib module maintainer who never really thought of their updates running with nobody actually actually looking at the notes and just completely you know, doing a production when they weren't looking. Um, that's not how I wrote my modules and thought people were gonna do it. So kind of would have to have like a mindset change as far as like people thinking like, oh, this. This could just update in the middle of the night for somebody, and they wouldn't definitely wouldn't look at the release notes. Um, so we'll see. Um, the contrib module could support it before core did, and we could see how it goes in contrib. Um, anybody could write a contrib module that does this, even if we didn't add it in our contrib module, and then we could see how that worked out. Um, any questions about like possible core feature rollout?
Okay, so let's take a look under the hood. Um, so there's three layers of this, automatic updates, package manager, and composer stager. And so it goes to the lowest level, and then automatic updates is the highest level. So let's look at, and then eventually this would be, project browser would also be at the top level, because it would also use the bottom two package manager composer stager to do its actual composer operations of installing new modules. Um, so let's look at composer stager. This is a PHP library, it's not Drupal specific. It, we, are, we have made it as part of the initiative, but you can run it without Drupal. Um, and it run, basically just runs composer commands in a staged environment. Um, you just tell it, you know, make a copy of my site or my PHP project and then run the stage command and then move it over. Um, and then above composer stager is package manager. So this is an API only Drupal module um, and it performs staged updates. So basically it calls composer stager and it could update any composer package. It's not specific to updating um, Drupal packages. It doesn't really know. It, it is a Drupal module, but the things it updates, it more considers just composer packages. Um, so an example would be, you know, this is what uh, automatic update thinks of. It's just, okay, I can only update Drupal, but package manager, it doesn't really matter what it updates. It doesn't matter what version it updates to and from all of the policy stuff about, well, you can only update, um, you know, patch releases during unattended, during attended, only do like minor updates via the form and not via unattended updates, that's all baked into automatic updates. And Composer, or Package Manager is really just a generic Composer staged command runner kind of thing. Um, so, the life cycle of automatic updates is basically the create, where we, we copy the active code base into the sandbox stage, require, and it updates the stage code base. You could perform multiple operations, and right now for Drupal Core, we just um, do the one. We actually do multiple packages, but one command, because you may have Drupal Core, or Drupal Core recommended, uh, and, and some other plugins that come which are really considered part of Drupal 4 like um, the scaffold and messaging plugins. And then apply stage is when we copy the active code base uh, stage changes to your live site and that is the, that stage is not really composer where it's more just file copying and this is to avoid like running a composer command that we haven't tested directly on your live site. And then destroy, just destroys your staged code base. Um, and then we have events at each one of these. Um, that These are symphony events, so you can write subscribers if you want to check something during pre-create, or if you want to you know, have something site-specific happen after a post-apply. And all of the pre-events, like pre-create, pre-require, pre-apply, pre-destroy, the subscribers that listen to these events can flag errors to basically stop the operation from happening. Um, so one, I think there are some examples here. Uh, so an example in the automatic updates module, we have this pending updates validator, and it listens to the pre-create event, and it flags an error if database updates, uh, if pending database updates exist, and prevents the operation from starting. So basically, if you have previous database updates that you've not applied, and you're starting to try to do an, another code level update, it'll say, hey, you can't, you have to actually run update.php or just update db before you can actually start this new update. Um, some other ones that we have are like, you know, just like, uh, I think disk space, we check if your file system is writable, we check if you have the right version of Composer, um, but then, I think I have some examples of some other ones. Oh, another example of a lock file creator um, or validator. This basically, during the pre-create event, it stores a hash of your active composer lock file. Um, and then pre-require and pre-apply, um, it flags an error if your active composer lock file is changed from that hash. The idea being, if you're staging the update, and then you do a require in the staged copy, but now you're also running composer commands in the active, 
you can't actually do that. So we, you know, for all we know, somebody could be on the terminal running whatever composer commands, and then when we did the apply over, we'd wipe those out. So basically, the idea is you're not expected to be running unknown composer commands that we don't know about on the site during the update process. So this is just a validator that we ran. Um, so yeah, it, it's, this is on the package manager level, not automatic updates, but anything that builds on top of pa package manager would run this validator. So this is a kind of example of, this is a validator that's built in, but you can sort of use the multiple events to write validators yourself for things we haven't thought of. Um, the other pack safeguards that Package Manager comes with is it prevents conflicting operations. So it has an idea of there's like one stage. So you can't be running a core automatic update and installing modules via Project Browser at the same time. So since they both use Package Manager, Package Manager sort of controls like, okay, only one operation should happen at the same time. It doesn't matter if it's automatic updates plus Project Browser plus like Project Browser plus contributed module, something like that. Um, and then it checks the basic, it also checks basic system requirements. So anything you write on uh, top of Package Manager, we can sort of get this stuff by default. Um, it also, this second point there, prevents, prevents disruptive operations while applying an update. So one example would be, you can't, in, can't uninstall a module as the update is applying. Um, so your kind of site sort of more locked, locked down in the very last stage of an update. Um, the update live cycles, basically with these subscribers, you can sort of customize the update experience for automatic updates for Project Browser and eventually for, um, for Project Browser automatic updates. Yeah, for that right now and then anything else that would build on top of Package Manager. Um, a lot of that would be preventing updates from happening in certain conditions that where you don't want them to happen. And then performing like starting and ending operations for the whole update process. Um, all right, so this is an example module of using package manager called peak time update preventer. Um, and it just requires the package manager module and prevents any package manager operation during peak time hours. So this, because automatic updates is built on package manager, this would prevent automatic updates. Um, so this is the whole, basically the whole subscriber module and the bulk of it is here. So at the top, we subscribe to two events, pre-create and pre-apply. So basically the very start of the update or right before the update's being applied because for all we know, you start the update and then leave it staged for like 10 hours and then you hit the apply. And then the function that we call in both of those cases, this is add error if peak time. Uh, we call the method is peak time, so this would be the custom code for that particular module. Um, and then if it is peak time, we just add this error and that would prevent any operations from happening. So it's pretty easy. You don't really have to know the ins and outs of how automatic updates works to sort of customize it. Um, and then this is the Tedbo module preventer uh, module. So again, it's very sort of simple module here where you have a subscriber and this is only happens on the pre-apply event and we have some uh, helper functions that get the active composer and the stage composer. So this is the, basically the, com I think it's the install.json, you can think of the composer lock for the active site that's running and then the stage site, stage copy. And then we just look at all the new, all the packages that aren't, that are, are in the stage but aren't in the active in this case, we just loop around, see if they start with Tedbo, and then you can't install any modules from Tedbo. So you do get pretty easy access to like the differences between your staged and your active composer code base. Um, all right, so then we look at automatic updates. Um, so the API for automatic updates is actually pretty thin. We provide this readiness check event, um, and this would where you can sort of do checks periodically or the automatic update module will fire these checks periodically and you can just check for custom things that might be 
that you know you want to make sure are good before you do a site, uh, do an update. Um, and the other customizations you would do to like the automatic update experience is really just using the package manager API and listening to those events. Automatic updates doesn't really need to provide that much of an API for itself. Um, oh yeah, this is how we would target, so using the package manager API, this is how we would target only automatic updates. Um, basically, there's a stage that's performing any update is owned by a particular stage. And the stage would be a class that's provided by, in this case, the updater class is provided by automatic updates. But if you wanted to, say, target um, Project Browser, once you know they have this, they will do something like Project Browser Installer will be another instance of the stage, and you could run your checks only if Project Browser is installed if you want the, your customization logic to only apply to Project Browser. Um, all of our current updates, we have a lot of policy validation around what you can update to and from as far as um, not being able to update to pre-releases, say during cron. All of that is based off looking at, okay, we're gonna first look if this is automatic updates versus some other use of package manager. Uh, project browser, yeah, so this is not real yet. It's just an example of what it would be like. Um, so again, there's beta testing after this session. Um, if anybody's interested, you basically just walk through and say, well, this worked or this didn't work, or you know, the UX is really confusing. Why do you have this link here? This message doesn't make any sense. So any feedback we can get, um, just let me know after the this session and we can walk over and, and run through it. Um, and the instructions, if you want to look at it afterwards, are on the home page. There's a very detailed, or the module page, there's a link to the instructions and you can sort of run through and test at any point. And we have a link to like file a new issue with some questions about you know what version of PHP were you on, what operating system did you try. Um, questions? I'm not actually sure when my session time is not clicked. Uh, you got uh, 3.30. Okay, cool. What, what has been like the biggest challenge so far? Um, yeah, uh, question is what is the biggest challenge so far? Um, the the update framework stuff has been pretty, uh, it's been challenging because there is libraries that use it for like, or that implement it for like Go and I don't know, some other languages. Python is one of the big ones that uses it. Um, and Drupal.org has been able to use the Python portion for making the server part, but we had to write a library in PHP to implement the um, the client side part because that we have, obviously are going we're not going to require everybody who wants to use this module to have Python. So if if we could have used their client, it would have been a lot easier. Um, but we did have that client to look at as far as implementation and and the people. At, um, who wrote the Python library and are involved with like setting up the the maintaining of the actual protocol itself were very helpful. So that was probably one of the hardest things. Yeah. Yeah. With it not being with it not being a core, what's the minimal um, core version? Version or versions of code and whatever to enter. Um, so nine, you have to have Drupal nine two right now, um, and. Mm -hmm. I think we may update that to 9.3 soon. The reason we didn't update it to 9.3 was because we want to be able to test the minor updates. So you have to have a minor update next, you know. So if we only supported 9.3, since 9.4 wasn't out yet, we couldn't actually test that. So right now it's 9.2. Um, so you just have Drupal 9.2. I think it has the same PHP requirement as Drupal 4. You have to have composer to a relative, a composer and a very relative recent version of it installed on the server too. And the reason of that is composer just came out with a security release last month or something. So we had to bump up our version requirement for composer. So it doesn't make sense to have an automatic update or with an insecure version of composer. Okay, so PH, the newer versions of PHP that I think seven two maybe is the Drupal 9 PHP requirement. Mm -hmm. So if you can... Because sometimes, the, yeah. e even though PHP is at a certain... Yeah. For 
core, it's yeah. you can't run something newer or maybe. Yeah. I think we're targeting the same version as core for now. Um, yeah. So theoretically, if core supports it, yeah, you should be good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So is this something that should just be run in like production and kind of keep it off our test environments and stuff? Sh uh, sh should it be? Uh, sh yeah, should because right now we yeah. use Aquia and yeah. production environment and that's publicly accessible. Yeah. We have Shield and everything else. Yeah. Should I just have automatic updates on production? No. You, test and everything, keep it off. So you could. We can post update it and you, a tag. Or? You can't have it on in production because Aquia doesn't provide like a writable environment. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you could run it in our in a cloud IDE, which is writable. Um, yeah. So this is not something, and yeah, I think a lot of you know we're really target. Even though I work for Aquia, you know we're sort of making it for the large Drupal community, yeah. and a lot of uh, you know a lot of sites maybe when Drupal isn't their main thing, they just don't apply security updates. So we have like tons of insecure sites out there, and that's kind of what. A lot of what we're targeting um, in that case because you know we don't I mean we've had bad sort of ecosystem wide security problems before and a lot of it's because um, the updates are exploited within like two weeks and then people you know 50% I don't know in two weeks most of the most of the ecosystem is not updated so hopefully if people had been running auto updates at that point then it's like you know one day you know, I don't know how what percentage of, of future sites would be running auto updates, but a lot of those sort of um, lower maintenance sites that are on cheaper hosting may have, hopefully all of them would have been updated. So. Questions? So, yeah, so we have other solutions at Aquia for like getting your site up to date, like the GitLab updates and stuff like that. And I imagine other hosts, I know, Pantheon does, so um, yeah, this isn't necessarily a solution for enterprise sites in production and stuff like that. Yeah. And if you have a CI pipeline user, like that yeah. would automatically run it on your tasks. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the update pipeline, yeah, we can have the test and I'll say, hey, we're, we're not passing this because security updates, we just don't have a tag. Yeah. Kind of yeah. If you have anything that works with GitHub, um, it's like just GitLab. GitHub as far as uh, you said that it automatically do the updates. Oh no, no, like Aquia specific stuff. Not this is not integrated with okay. GitHub or GitLab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, if anybody's interested in testing it, let me know. It does take like maybe five, ten minutes or whatever, and it's mostly just sort of running a few commands that we have and then clicking through. So, all right. Thanks. <laughs>